Welcome to the Fleet Insider podcast. Today we're joined by Mark Cartwright, who is the current head of commercial vehicle incident prevention at National Highways. But rather than she shoot to the audience, Mark, welcome. And uh, I'd love you to uh, to introduce everyone to who you are and what you currently do. Yeah, thanks, James. I'm slightly worried about the use of the word current in my job description, unless there's something that you know that I don't know. But uh... Yeah, um, uh, I've got two roles at National Highways, uh, sit alongside each other quite well. Uh, I'm the team leader for the Commercial Vehicle Incident Prevention Team, which is basically a team of project managers looking for interventions, good ideas, wizard wheezes, whatever you want to call them, that will reduce the frequency and severity of collisions on our network involving vans and trucks primarily. Uh, and I also, and I'll, I just like this phrase because I've never been called responsible before, but my other job title is I'm the senior responsible officer for our Driving for Better Business uh, campaign. Driving for Better Business is all about trying to communicate good practice, raise awareness of issues around road safety within uh, commercial organisations. So the two sides of them fit together pretty well. So we create stuff within the commercial vehicle incident prevention team and then we try and distribute and raise awareness of it using our DFBB voice. So how do how do you guys do that? So where do you where do you start? Obviously, you know, we all see commercial vehicles going up and down the motorway and around local local towns and villages and cities. But how do you as you know within your job and your project managers you said, how do you how do you help prevent accidents and how do you get your message across to those to those organizations i guess there's two parts of it to be honest two parts to the answer james is we're very data driven so we're looking at data from our network on a on a regular consistent basis and try and understand what are the causations of incidents are there trends that are developing other things coming down the tubes say from a technological advancement point of view that we ought to be aware of but we've also have got terrific links with the industry, uh, not just operators directly, but also through organisations, you know, such as Cortex, for example, where we're getting feedback and are in conversation with them a lot of the time, getting feedback as to what's on their mind, anything that they can see developing as well. And very often there's a kind of almost a consensus of opinion as to where we should be uh, putting our, our firepower, I suppose, for want of a better phrase with it. Um, there was a very good example just after I joined Highways, to be honest. I, um, my previous uh, employment, I was working with uh, the, the Trade Association, formerly known as Trade Transport Association, Logistics UK, as they are now. And I was doing all the van related stuff that they were doing, so the Van Excellence Programme, etc. And when I arrived here, we, it became pretty obvious talking to operators, looking at some of the data from the network is we were putting an awful lot of effort into the hgv side of it now that isn't to say that hgvs don't crash they do the slightly inconvenient truth is that they don't crash that often but when they do it tends to be big and horrible because the laws of physics get involved but actually vans um crash a lot vans present quite a significant risk to themselves and other road users so we put an awful lot of effort into increasing activity around the light commercial vehicle side of it and understanding what operators need, trying to understand what the causations of incidents are, trying to com come up with some kind of um, product, some kind of solution that will will help in there, and then communicating it out through our driving for better business arm. So if any of your listeners are, are into the van side of things, just have a quick Google for vandrivertoolkit.co.uk and you'll find all of, our, all of our stuff there. And it's probably worth mentioning um, all of the stuff we do with both of my hats on is FOC to the users because he's already paid for by, by the taxpayers basically. So there's an awful lot of really good positive information there that people can tap into. And what are those risks, Mark? So from not only the organisation or the business themselves, but actually the the guys and the girls that are in the vans driving, what what are the different types of risks for again, like I said, the business itself and then actually the drivers? Yeah, it's an interesting question that James is when we look back at the various initial causations of incidents, which we, we, we're doing an awful lot of work on at the moment. What we tend to identify is very, very few crashes are caused by vehicle condition. Yet vehicle condition is the thing that an awful lot of operators of all sizes, of all 
types of operation tend to concentrate on the talk about you know great pride about their vehicles being roadworthy the, the 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 reality of it is hardly any crashes are ever instigated by vehicle failure they're virtually all about what we call the the four known unknowns but i say that with a bit of a, a smile on my face because actually we think there's five um the four are impairment drug alcohol impairment uh drug impairment is worth mentioning people tend to immediately think of recreational substances of course they play a part but actually there's an awful lot of over-the-counter self-medication stuff going on there in terms of medical conditions so impairment drug and alcohol uh distraction is a big one uh fatigue again is a big one medical conditions play into it and the way we tend to think of it if you almost look at it as a venn diagram is where you get one to a couple of those things overlapping so you get a distracted and a fatigue driver actually you really do have a significant risk within your organization the the fifth one in case anybody's wondering is attitude uh, which is an interesting one to start the conversation with and we've all heard the old you know kind of giveaway line you wouldn't drive you wouldn't drive your own vehicle the way you're driving that van or company car or whatever uh, but it's true you know so there's a whole piece in there around the the driver elements and the phrase which we use an awful lot now is vehicles don't crash people do and it's the reality is it's, it's the people that crash they just happen to be in a vehicle at the time mm -hmm. so there's an awful lot of work going on around that one of the phrases which we're trying to get people thinking about an awful lot at the moment is driver roadworthiness so i talk to a lot of organizations as i say where they're pretty confident that their vehicle roadworthiness is there or thereabouts but is a driver and the, the honest answer is i don't think they know most of the time and i know this might sound a little bit um a little bit flippant so i do apologize but you know if you're if you're involved in a fleet whether you're a big fleet with you know vocational fleet managers and all the rest of it or whether you're the you know small building company down the road with two or three vans running out of it it's not difficult to go up to one of your drivers and say can you just go and check your vehicle over again those tires don't look right to me or i don't think your lights are all working or it looks overloaded or whatever that's actually a really quite a straightforward conversation and the answer will be a binary answer they're either going to come back and say yes it's okay or they're going to come back and say yeah good point i've sorted it out but walking up to somebody and saying mate you look absolutely shocking this morning are you all right that's a really quite a difficult conversation which in my experience a lot of people will shy away from you know before you know it you've got the unions on your back if it's a unionized organization you've got your hr people getting involved but actually the fact that for whatever reasons that guys may be lacking in sleep or is you know got other things going on in their life which they're dealing with in whatever way that's actually the real big risk for the organization and i guess for some of the smaller fleets where they typically lend themselves to industries where you know it's quite laddy you're on site maybe again you know those conversations probably aren't had as much as they should be no and i think there's always a parallel i know this might sound a little bit ambitious but you know you think as a nation you know, we've come on in terms of mental health over the last 10 15 years you know we see the adverts on the tv every night are you all right no are you sure you're all right ask the question start the conversation wouldn't it be great if we were getting similar kind of approach in terms of physical health which is where the risk is yeah no it's very true so i guess then it, that lends itself on to some of the initiatives that you guys have um you know what are they um for again for both drivers and actually organizations themselves and um and how does i guess they you know prevent what we're trying to do here which is prevent more incidents mm, we've probably got about 12 13 projects on the run at any one time so i'm bore you with all the gaudy details of them but i'll give you some ideas of it some tasters and over they're, they're starting to kind of join up as well which is which is which is interesting it's starting to overlap i guess the project that my team run which more people have heard of than anything else is operation tramline so that's where we lend police units around the country um one of an undisclosed number of modified hgv cabs there's somewhere between two and four of them normally um We'll then bump the cabs to work as elevated camera platforms on the network. So they are the ones which are featured in some of the TV documentaries where you'll, you know, we'll have footage of drivers finding new and inventive ways of distracting themselves from the job of driving. Uh, HGV drivers account for about 40% of the interventions, but 30% uh, effort, about 30% car drivers, 30% van drivers. And a lot of it is really straightforward, but dangerous stuff it, it always makes me smile i do most of the um 
got a PR stuff for them. So you'll, you know, find a microphone or a, a microphone or a, tea, a camera stuck in your face. And the question you tend to get is, what's the funniest, strangest, weirdest thing that you guys have ever seen? And we have seen some pretty odd stuff when they're out there. But the reality of it is most of it is really boring because it's mobile phone usage and not wearing seatbelts, which isn't particularly, um, you know, funny or, or entertaining, but it's dangerous, which is a real problem. So a tram line's a big one for us. I mentioned a lot of the van related activity that we've been pulling together. Uh, we've got a major project on at the moment looking at post-collision trauma response. So plan A is we stop people crashing. Plan B is they have crashed. How do we keep them alive long enough for the fully trained paramedic to turn up in a state of the art ambulance? There's a, some horrible stats floating around with that, James, is that uh, the paramedics people are tell us that there's something like 60, 70 odd percent of the incidents where, you know, sadly the victim dies before reaching hospital would probably have been preventable with some pretty basic first aid on scene around, primarily, primarily around cardiac issues, you know, CPR, uh, bleed control, literally just pushing and stopping people bleeding uh, and clearing airways. That's, that's a horrible statistic. So it's about trying to raise awareness of, as a bystander, what you could be doing if you come across the scene of a crash, making the best 999 call anybody's ever made and reducing the response times, protecting the scene with your vehicle if it's appropriate and it's the right kind of vehicle. But, and maybe if you're that way inclined, getting involved with a bit of medical triage and a bit of first aid provision. So there's a big piece going on around that at the moment. Um, we're also doing a lot of work around uh, research into fatigue and how businesses ought to be able to predict fatigue across their workforce, etc. So there's a lot of stuff going on. The big thing, and I wouldn't necessarily call it a, a project, James, it's maybe a bit more of a strategy, but we're trying to adopt is something we're calling the power of procurement which is a very odd name for a title and to be blunt for the project and to be honest i wish we would have thought of something else but we're stuck with it now um but it's that basic concept that you know if you even think about it in your own driving experience is we've all experienced poor driving on the network with various degrees of risk attached to it the reality of it is i can make a very solid argument but at least 50 percent of the drivers on the road at any one time are only there because they're working in fact the figure's probably higher than that the basic maths are we know there's about half a million trucks out there so they're being driven for work there's in excess of four and a half million vans out there so let's just be conservative and keep the arithmetic easy so they're being driven for work four and a half million vans half a million trucks there's five million vehicles being driven for work there's then company cars Figures declining, but it's about a million. So there's six million vehicles being driven for work. You then get into the world of grey fleet, which is is an interesting world. Uh, there's lots of lots of estimates out there as to how many grey fleet drivers are, which vary between about 10 million, about 22, 23 million. So we just we just picked on 14 million as a pretty conservative kind of figure, and it keeps the arithmetic easy. So that gives us 20 million vehicles, which I could argue are being driven for work. Rather conveniently, that's about half of all the vehicles registered in the UK. Now, you know, if we went down to our favourite piece of motorway and we stood there and we watched the traffic coming past, it'd be way more than 50% of those vehicles are being driven for work. Now, the reason I'm making such a point of that is you, we will all know that those drivers are employees. They're subject to health and safety at work legislation. The organisation has their health and safety at work duties to create a safe working environment for their, for their workers, for other people that they come into contact with. And one of the things over my years around the industry, which has, I suppose, fascinated me and terrified me in equal amounts of a number of very health and safety robust organisations I see that fundamentally lob their drivers a set of keys, pat them on the head and wish them the best of luck. Whereas within the premises, they've got every safeguard or measure in place. And somehow that joining the dots about the fact that that driver is still subject to all of the legislation you're still subject to all the penalties and everything that comes with it so it's past people's mind so power of procurement is about very much about getting organizations to understand their obligations and to treat road risk in the same way as they would treat any any other risk within their organization and the procurement bits in is, is must be demanding buyers you know if, if we are if i take highways as an example we wouldn't employ somebody to come and build a bridge for us unless we were pretty sure they know where to build a bridge without ensuing carnage but are we as 
challenging about their abilities to operate vehicles in a safe and proper manner. Now, you know, if you cascade that across, there's an awful lot of influence, I guess, that can be put on your working drive. Is that because you feel that the business and society, again, I'm not, you know, I don't want this to be a, a wider societal issue here, but is it because we undervalue what a driver does? Yeah, I think there's two things, to be honest, James. One, the bit that's missing with the health and safety legislation is road-related incidents aren't riddled reportable in the same way as somebody, something happening on site would be. And I think that can help, can influence health and safety professionals to maybe take their eye off the ball in terms of road risk. If it was riddled reportable, I think it would be a significantly different scenario that we're seeing. But I also do think that as a nation, we don't necessarily take driving as seriously as we should do for most of us unless you've got a very extreme uh, kind of hobby or anything driving will easily be the most dangerous thing any one of us do on any one particular day um, there was a a static colleague of mine came up with and it's quite it's quite an interesting thing this if you're doing this in front of an audience you ask people if they do the national lottery and all these hands go up and say yeah i do a lottery you do really realise the chances of you winning the lottery this week are 82,000 times worse than your chances of actually being injured in a crash this week. Don't quote me on the figures, guys. I've just tried to remember those. But it, there is significantly less chance of you winning the lottery than there is of you actually being injured on the road this week. Now, that tends to concentrate because we just take it for granted, don't we? And equally with the, you know, the way we... we as a, as a society, and I say I don't want this to get too high level on this, but we the way we interact with the logistics and the transport function is we just take it for granted because it just happens and we don't think about it. But actually, we're exposing people to risk every time we order a pizza or order something off Amazon or expect our gas engineer to turn up. There's a risk attached to all of this. Mm. So how can how can fleets um, ensure that we can reduce that risk as much as possible for the drivers, the business, you know, how how, how can a business mitigate that risk as, as, as much as possible? I think the first thing is understanding the fact that the risk exists from being truthful. Okay. Um, driving is something we all take for granted. We all assume we have a right to drive and to a certain extent, I guess, to behave how we feel when we're driving. But if as an organisation you're asking the same challenging questions of your staff, your people, as you would be, you know, in driving as you would be if they were involved in, I don't know, a construction project or something like that. We did some work a while ago for um, uh, in the in the final mile sector, I won't name the companies involved with this, but, you know, they, they had an awful lot of emphasis on what was going on within their sites. You know, whole discussions about people scalding their fingers on cups of coffee, which were too hot out the vending machine and, <laughs> excuse me, falling downstairs and finding new and inventive ways of cutting off bits of anatomy and sortation hubs and stuff. They had absolutely no real idea of what was going on out on the road, other than the fact that the vehicles were out there. They were roadworthy. I'll, I'll give them that. But were the drivers roadworthy to come back to that previous point? It's, it's interesting. If you apply the same kind of health and safety smarts to the road situation as many of these health and safety leaders apply to everything else that's going on with the business, I think we go a long way. A long way forward on this in terms of you know making the road safer and obviously with <clears throat> with technology advancing as quickly as it is you know we've got the likes of cortex how can mm. they help a fleet how can you know from your perspective mark you know is a tracking system like vortex able to reduce the risk for that business and that driver Okay, let me just quickly get the small print here. I'm, I'm obliged to be supplier agnostic with all of this, but I of think course. behavioral telematics is a very powerful tool for all kinds of businesses, and the cost that's attached to it now is is reachable, I would argue, for most organizations, particularly if you can get the insurers to dip their hands into their pockets and help out and all the rest of it. But I think I think there's a number of angles to this. I think for the drivers to understand that there is some degree of monitoring going on on their behaviours is a good start, good point. The kind of data, rich data that a fleet operator can be pulling back from systems such as Cortex, I think is absolutely invaluable with this. Um, I will say out loud, um, one of the things I've always liked about the Cortex system is the, the safe speed piece because you know we know speed is a significant 
uh, area of causation of incidents and certainly makes them more serious. Um, so I think as a, if I was in the, if I was operating the fleet directly, James, right at the top of my list would be a good uh, driver behavioural telematics program. If you don't know what people are doing, you can't manage it. it, it you're right. The the amount of people that it is accessible to every business now because of the cost, uh, the barrier to entry is so low. And like you said, actually the the data that's that you get back from these platforms like Hortix is invaluable. And we've had you know people on here before who have spoken about how they've how they've managed to get their drivers to interact in a positive light with tracking systems i think something we've we've had in the past probably more when you know the technology first arrived was you're just following me like big brother and checking out what i'm doing where actually what some of these firms have, have, have tried to do now is try to gamify it and based on where you come you can get incentives like amazon vouchers etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's not just a sort of head office versus the driver where you know it's actually you know getting everyone on board um but like you said the, the data that's the data you get back from the from from platforms as like Ortix is invaluable um and every business should um should be implementing something of that ilk what's crazy though is still you know 30 percent of the market have still not used or adopted this technology mm. No, absolutely. And, you know, I can, there will be all kinds of reasons why that is the case. But I can always come back to the fact that, one, you're investing in an expensive piece of kit in terms of the vehicle. You're investing in an expensive member of your ta team, probably potentially an invaluable member of your team. So why wouldn't you be wanting to protect both of your assets, the human asset assets and the, the physical assets? Uh, there's a whole piece in there about reputational risk. You know, you could be hurtling around the place in a vehicle with your name written on the side of it in six foot high letters which is hardly a good a good advert and you know to come back to the point you made earlier the barriers to entry i think are significantly lower than they used to be if i it would be right at the top of my list that's all i'm saying in terms of uh, what i'd be looking for if i was a fleet manager are there any are there any other pieces of advice for a fleet manager that you feel that you know going away from the tracking element um to improve their overall safety for their drivers and again for the business itself i think fairly typically you can break the risk down into driver journey and uh, vehicle um i find many fleet operators are actually really good at managing their vehicle conditions so, and, and making the right choices and will often lean on their lease providers and their manufacturer colleagues to to help advise that. That, that that's terrific the only thing i always come back with a vehicle is you're only as good really as your last check of your vehicle you know so certainly in terms of tire management in particular um i've also you know an awful lot of the incidents that we get see bad bad outcomes of i guess uh vehicle loading is important uh making sure loads are secure and evenly measured one of the things that on the tyre side of things is probably worth mentioning, I know when we've done some work with some fairly major fleets around the place, we tend to find that their tread depth management, their tyre replacement policies are pretty decent. We we don't very often uh, with them come across ball tyres. Uh, what we do find is an awful lot of tyres with, with low pressures on them, so they're pretty good at changing tyres. They're not that good at maintaining and keeping them inflated afterwards. And it's a big one, um, you know, a van, may not be the best loaded vehicle that's out there in terms of insecure load load distribution you throw a, a deflated tire in there in, a, in any kind of emergency maneuver you've got a really unstable vehicle there so the piece that under inflated tires as well aren't very good at clearing water you know so if there's any sanding water on the network that, that could be a bit of an issue um driver is where the biggest piece is for me to come back to where we we were talking a little bit earlier you know so as a whatever job title you want to give the fleet manager the md of an organization if it's small is know your drivers understand what their behaviors are like you know i know it sounds a little bit like trying to manage a football team but you know if you've got a, a driver there who's just had an happy addition to their family keep an eye on them because they're likely to be getting fatigued if you've got somebody going through a you know a traumatic life experience a divorce or a parent that's sick or whatever you know they're going to be under pressure and one of the things that you know playing into that is so often hindsight is, is 2020 isn't it i mean with so many things in life but 
there was a there was a case of a few months ago of an HGV driver who got sent down uh, for going to sleep at the wheel and crashing into a vehicle and there was a fatality involved with it. And you know, you read the art press articles about it, which was all we really had to look at, but everybody in the business seemed to know that this fella couldn't stay awake for more than 30 minutes at a time without a can of Red Bull or a strong cup of coffee. So, you know, it's easy to point the finger afterwards and say, of oh, course, we knew that was going to happen, but why didn't somebody do something about it? Then it mm. comes back, I think, to some of this difficulty about engaging with that kind of health side of things across the driver roadworthiness piece, I guess, is what I'm trying to say there. So that's that's an important piece, of course. Um, I think the biggest single message I say is take it seriously because, it, you know, and I know a lot of fleet managers do and I know a lot of people in the business do, but lean on your colleagues, lean on your health and safety professionals, your occupational health people if they're within your organisation. They've all got a role to play in this. It's a lot more than just managing the metal. I, I and, and it's been great having you on today, Mark. The the person behind the wheel is is as valuable, more valuable than than the, the vehicle itself. There are there are unroadworthy vehicles out there. There are poorly loaded vehicles out there, and all that. But the reality of it is, with a little bit of application, that's not really that difficult to sort out. What is more difficult is the fact that I've got a driver who is. I mean, in the HGV world, I went. Uh, I was in a, an event a few years ago, now, and it was probably one of the most uncomfortable presentations I've ever seen for a bloke of my age. And the guy who was speaking was an NH NHS statistician. He said, "Look, I know nothing about your industry, but I do know how to crunch data, uh, health data." He said, "If you bear in mind, in the HGV world, the average age of an HGV driver now is late fifties, early sixties." And to be blunt, they're a ticking time bomb by and large in terms of health issues. And, you know, it's got to, it's recognized. But he said, look, by the time you're in your late 50s, statistically, you were almost bound to have one medium to long term health issue. It might be musculoskeletal, it might be hypertension, it might be diabetes, it might be sleep apnea, obesity, whatever. But you're almost bound to have one statistically. By the time you find yourself in your late 50s, early 60s, it's probably two. As you get a little bit older, it's probably three. Now, the reality of it is they're not, they're not weird statistics. That's the bloke who's just driven that truck past you on the motorway. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole piece there as, an, as, as a society about how we better manage that. The van, van drivers, you know, not as pronounced, tend to be a younger demographic, tend to be more active. But it's the driver behind the wheel, which is primarily the risk. So why wouldn't you want to be presenting that and using that to the best possible uh to its best advantage and equally to the to the lowest amount of risk that you can cause no you're totally right well mark thank you so much for coming on today um before we go where can where can people find out more about again all the good things you guys are doing what's the what's the website or is it on linkedin is it where can we find this yeah a couple so of things if, if, if if your listeners google driving for better business i'll come across all of the good stuff there including the van driver toolkit we've got a specific web address around the driving change as we're calling it which is around this influencing organizational change so drivingchange.info is your place there and you know if, if you if your listeners want to just kind of pick me up on linkedin we always push everything out through linkedin as well so uh either way around you'll you'll get access and find access and just reinforce everything that we do is very high quality but it's all free as well so please use it brilliant well mark thank you very much for your time today thank you for coming on and um yeah just keep doing the good work you guys are doing yeah cheers thanks for the opportunity james